So uh, Igor Caron uh, ha has a diploma d'ingénieur from INPG and then uh, he went to uh, the US and got a PhD from Texas A&M University. And after that, he has held several positions in uh, nuclear and aerospace engineering. Um, he was uh, always interested in many uh, topics, including uh, mathematics and particularly uh, compressed sensing. He has been uh, writing the, the recognized uh, and uh, blog called uh, Rue Blanche on the theme of compressing sensing for a few years. And also he, he created the Paris Machine Learning a group with more than 8,000 8, members and uh, more than 100 meetups in the Paris in, in the region of Paris. And finally, in 2016, he uh, co-founded Dyton, uh, the company, with uh, several others, and he is now the CEO of his, uh, this company. And I suppose uh, you will talk uh, to us about uh, what Dyton uh, does, and you now have the, the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gilles, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the organizer for having me um, on um, for this uh, presentation. I've got about 30 minutes. I'll try to explain a little bit what we do at uh, Lighton, and um, hopefully I'll uh, try to get uh, to be answering a few questions. But if you can't ask your questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us uh, through emails and everything to to make sure that it does uh, so. All right, so let me uh, share my uh, uh, full screen. Um, you should be able to see, um, uh, I'm going through the panorama. And so the subject of the talk today is gonna be about, uh, let me try to remove yeah, my face from here because I can't see everything. Computing AI with uh, with light. Um, Lighton was created from uh, with uh, four co-founders, uh, I'm one of them. Uh, the three other co-founders are Laurent Daudet, uh, Sylvain Gigant, and Florent jean -Claire. And out of the four uh, uh, co-founders, we all have four PhDs, except three of them are physics professors, and I'm not one of them. So um, let's get on to um, discussing why we're talking about AI and light. So uh, what has happened in the past year has been earth shattering on many respects. Uh, one, of, uh, uh, what, one of the big news of the last year is not really the COVID, it's really what happened back in June by the release of a GPT-3 uh, um, model by uh, OpenAI. It's a startup company back in, uh, in the US, in California. And they have been able to build one of the largest language model ever. And, uh, and what is very interesting is they've gone through several iterations of these models, but this is the first time we get to see that now it gets to have um, something that we as human consider something like getting to understand a bit the context of what is being uh, spoken when you are interacting with that system. And so to give you a simple example, because there are many of them on the internet, uh, I'd like to essentially just point out one of these uh, outputs uh, this is uh, a small uh, GIF of sorts that essentially uh, outputs whatever um, you're asking the model uh, while you have been training the model, while you haven't been training the model on anything, really. You have been training the model on a very large amount of data. Some of this data includes some of the, uh, the codes, uh, the, the, the language that you are using to uh, uh, do uh, some coding, and uh, some of them includes Keras and, and other uh, uh, type of languages. And so when you are asking this model to essentially um, uh, write a, a computer code uh, based on the specification that you're giving through uh, the text, uh, see what happens. So this is the model you want. And you're basically asking the model to take this sentence and give you an answer to that. And this is the answer. What's absolutely fascinating here is that to a very large extent, we're beginning to see uh, the first time where we do not have to specifically train a model on a specific task. We get to be learning different tasks, mostly because now these models are getting better and better the context of what the request is. So 
what is really happening nowadays is really that there is a race going on. That is, GPT-3 is just one step. Um, the next step is really getting to have it bigger. And, and, and the underlying reason for it is mostly that when you're looking at these language models and other models that are multimodal eventually, is that you're getting better and better performances as soon as you're getting better, bigger and bigger models. And so when GPT-3 at 175 billion parameters, you are expecting to have better performances with something that has 10 times more uh, parameters or sometimes that has uh, something that has about a thousand times more models. And really the main primary is that you're getting to the point where even though now you can you, if you get to be able to train these models, you get to have an accuracy that is much beyond what you have been able to see uh, before in computer science. But the main problem is, is really that you have to um, uh, probably have a different type of hardware to do all these things. So one of the ways for people in uh, over uh, OpenAI, but also Baidu and other uh, entities are looking at this and say, well, out of all these computing experiments that we do, is there, are there any uh, specific rules that we can get out of this? And sure enough, what we're getting to see nowadays is the appearance of what we call scaling laws. To a very large extent, it's, it's basically a lot of uh, computations being done and how to empirically fit uh, the behavior of the overall system so that eventually you get to have larger and larger models, but you get to know exactly why each of the parameters need to be used in a certain way. And as you can see on the on the, on, on the on the right side at the bottom, you begin to have very uh, empirical-ish type of uh, 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 ways to to figure out exactly how the loss of of your function is going to be, uh, because it's not going to be a function of different parameters with a certain exponent. Everything that is absolutely empirical, but this is absolutely needed to essentially go uh, go a bit further because these models being so huge, you don't get to have that many uh, uh, computing uh, training uh, uh, capabilities and you don't get to be training that many that often. But what's very fascinating here is if uh, we've been here before, we've been on this territory before, back in 1920s, 1930, um, you could see that people were very much concerned about getting to understand how heat transfer was going on, how fluid mechanics was going on so that you could build better cars, you could build better power plants, you could build better uh, electric, uh, electrification systems. And so by having this whole need from the industrial uh, base for some type of law so that you could be designing those things, people have been coming up with very similar type of scaling laws based on essentially dimensionist numbers coming out of physics where you, instead of having numbers like uh, the number of iterations uh, like we see in these models for GPT-3 and so forth, you get to be looking at uh, specifically the velocity, the, 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 the type of temperatures and any type of the components that you have in the liquids to essentially figure those things out. What's also absolutely interesting here is that the, the parallel is very, uh, it's taking you back when you look back at this because you get to see that most of the engineering that we know, most of the engineering that is on which we are living on today is absolutely dependent on these scaling laws. That is, up until very recently, we could essentially do much better simulations on HPCs, but a large part of the engineering that on which we live today is basically based on these uh, scaling laws. And so back in 2020, we get to be able to see people that are doing absolutely magnificent type of uh, simulations on the high performance computing, mostly based on uh, a, a keen understanding of some of these uh, Navier-Stokes equations and so forth. But deep down, a lot of these uh, uh, empirical uh, uh, laws still subside. And, and you get to be able to even see those things, mostly because uh, at the very beginning, we were able to build those things from from, uh, from these scaling laws. And so what is really, um, if I were to be taking a parallel with regard to what we see in the AI these days, we need to be able to see what has happened in this whole heat transfer and fluid mechanics type of uh, deal for the past hundred years. And so to get to the stage where we have these very good looking type of uh, uh, simulations, 
we needed to have three ingredients. One of them is the need. What you see here is the number of cars that were built after uh, 1900, and you get to see two bumps. One of them is the um, is the 1929 crisis, and the other one is uh, World War II. But from there on, you can see that the need is there. Everybody wants to have a car, and everybody wants to have a car that goes faster. Everybody wants to have a car that is also better designed and also can uh, be much safer as we go along. The second thing, second ingredient is really, how do we go about uh, doing those uh, computations? And one of the ways to do this is to do uh, computing at a massive scale. And uh, HPC, uh, high performance computing, has been doing that for the past 30 years, really, a little bit more, but really uh, for the case of doing free dynamics and heat transfer, it's been there for about 30 years. And, and really it's been, uh, in the acceptance level only in about 10 years in, in those industries that really need to, uh, to do those things like transportation and so forth. And the third thing is really the algorithm. And, and you know, when you're looking at all the other algorithms that have been developed in the past uh, uh, 100 years, uh, most of them have been there mostly as a way to make sure that computing hardware would essentially be doing uh, well in terms of what those simulations would be doing. And so now we have to go back to what are the three ingredients for AI in 2020s. What is the need? And so a lot of people would say, you know, AI is needed or not, or it's ethical and everything. All, our, all these things are very good questions. But what we see now at Lighton and many other outfits is really that there is a push for getting those very large models. NVIDIA just came out with a prediction that in about uh, five years, that's five years from now, 2026, 2025, uh, we ought to be seeing at least one client who would be willing to pay for one model for about a billion dollars. Training one model for one million, a billion dollars. Billion dollars with a B. What is the computing hardware? We think it's going to be HPC plus something else. And what is going to be, what are going to be the algorithm? And what is going to be the algorithm that we know plus others, obviously. But the main problem with the hardware we see that nowadays, especially for the training, is that even though Moore's law is still going on, probably not in the same pace as we've been accustomed to, it's not going as fast as what the models require. The mass, the massive effort that you see in the training for these large models occupies a whole data center. GPT-3 requires a thousand type of uh, uh, GPUs for a few months to essentially get it to, to be trained. And so if you're looking at GPT-4, 5, and 6, you're multiplying by 10 every time, and you see the sheer size of the needs that are going on there. And not just uh, the sheer size, but the sheer size essentially also tells you that you need to have different type of algorithm because otherwise, you're not going to be able to uh, have more HPCs. Those HPCs need to be hired, uh, wired in a way that allows those algorithms to actually work efficiently or allow for the GPUs or the CPUs that are being run to be fully utilized. And if you do not have the right algorithm, you basically are not spending, you're spending about 80% of the time for the GPU or the CPU to be doing nothing and waiting for information. Um, one of the uh, very interesting uh, insight is that one by uh, Sarah Hawker on the uh, hardware lottery. I invite you to uh, take a look at, uh, uh, at it. It's, it's very insightful. It's essentially how do we go about choosing the, the tooling and the research ideas that are succeeding or failing, and how do we do this uh, when we have a certain type of hardware? And the hardware lottery is really about making sure uh, the, the, the fact that sometimes some algorithms are doing much better than others, mostly because they're working on specific hardware. As soon as you're changing the hardware, you really need to have the right algorithm that fits into this. Otherwise, it's just hardware and no one's going to be interested in, in what you have to say besides building it and if, if anyone wants it. And so at Lighton, we've been looking at this from uh, uh, this perspective, that is, you cannot do a hardware without doing AI, and you can do AI without doing the hardware. And so we've been looking at this training of hardware 
uh, beyond what we call backpropagation, which is the workhorse of uh, deep learning these days. And we've been looking at uh, half of the company at Lighton is mostly an AI uh, uh, team that has been looking at uh, these novel AI, uh, novel training methods that are going beyond backpropagation. And eventually, how do we go about having a dedicated hardware when you know everything about the, the algorithm itself? Uh, if you know a bit about backpropagation, which, as I said, is the workhorse of how you uh, uh, train those uh, algorithms, uh, you know that uh, it's a fundamentally uh, sequential process. Uh, the thing of it is the data has to go through each of the layers. Uh, the computations are matrix vector multiplications, and then you have some linearities, and then eventually you go on to the next one. And then when you have a result at the very end, what you want to do is do the actual learning and the actual learning is making sure that you you take you compute the loss you you basically compute the gradients and you essentially forward back backwards in into the the process and you go layer by layer and that process is being sequential and there is no way around it there is no other way to to essentially train those very large algorithms so at Lighton, we've been uh, looking at different algorithms. Uh, one of them is called uh, direct feedback alignment. Uh, it came out from uh, someone who uh, wrote about it uh, and uh, published about it in, in Europe in 2016, um, um, on, on the fact that there is potentially a, poss a possibility of, uh, in the backward pass of uh, the training of algorithm, to go uh, potentially embarrassingly parallel, as we call it in uh, HPC. Uh, the point of it is you still go for the forward me methods of essentially getting your data from one layer to the other. And then eventually when you are at the output, instead of taking the loss and distributing it from to the uh, layer uh, that was before all the way to and sequentially backwards, you essentially um, uh, uh, give out uh, that, uh, that loss and you multiply it by a random matrix. You do a random projection on that on that, uh, on that loss, and you distribute it directly to each of the layers, all at the same time. And by the same token, you essentially remove this whole sequential process and you make it a wholly parallelized one. And one of the things that I would like to point out is really that it's by no means something that is uh, obvious. Uh, when you're looking at random projections, you're really looking at something that is uh, of the order in mathematics, since we are at a at the colloquium about mathematics today, we're talking about uh, understanding random projections, and a lot of it comes from compressive sensing and uh, earlier by uh, Johnson and Lyndon Strauss back in 84. But the point of it is that even using random projections here, for those people that know about random projection, is still a bit uh, not explained at all. And so we're looking forward for anyone to explain to us a bit why it works so well but I'll get to that a little bit later. The point of it is, when you are uh, changing this algorithm to be going from a sequential to a parallel one, you get to be saving a lot of time and you get to be able to make sure that the GPUs that are in each of the layers get to be used uh, more efficiently. And so DFA, uh, this direct feedback alignment scales to modern uh, data, uh, deep learning uh, uh, tasks and architectures. And so we've been showing that at uh, at the latest uh, New York's uh, conference, where we showed that it actually works in uh, for graph convolution, uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, as well as your scenes that with uh, modeling with uh, one of these uh, algorithms called NERF, as well as uh, uh, hybrid transfor uh, transformers. Main limitation is really that you have to fight uh, backpropagation on the and backpropagation has essentially been. Uh, 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 optimized in the past 20, 30, 40 years, whereas we're just looking at this uh, at this model here, at this algorithm, and it really does not have that much history, and it really does not have that much theoretical understanding, but it still works. And in computer science, you get to see that whenever that works, it's, it's good enough. A little bit like the engineers back in the 1930s when they were designing those heat transfer for, um, for the regulators of cars. The other interesting thing is that you can also do hybrid strategies of DFAs and backpropagation at the same time. And most of the important part is that since it works on all these architectures, it's architecture 
agnostic. And that's one of the very interesting part of this uh, story. And so now uh, we have to fit this back into, okay, how do we go about doing random projection for, uh, to be able to actually implement this DFA in, uh, in training those very large networks. And so uh, in order to do random projection, which is a multiplication of a very large random matrix with a vector uh, of data, uh, well, you have to do several things. You have to generate uh, lots of random numbers. You have to store them in the matrix, and then you have to do the matrix multiplication that you would be doing on CPU and GPU. And so, um, as I'm pointing out here, it's this process is neither fast nor scalable using current currency data. And and one of the ways uh, we've been uh, looking at this is leveraging the physics of light. Uh, and how light interacts with diffusive media as a way to get this, uh, uh, this process done. And so what you get to see here are two different things. So first of all, on top, you get to see that uh, you have an X, which is essentially the uh, about to be multiplied by a matrix. I, I realize that this is the wrong notation for mathematicians, but in machine learning, they get to be using uh, different notations. I think it's on purpose to make sure that mathematicians are not coming up uh, to, to them and explaining them the, the work. But the, the, the point of it here is you get to multiply this H by X and you get Y. Uh, X is a bunch of vectors, uh, is a vector with, uh, that can be represented on what we call a spatial light modulator. And then you, you shine a laser on the spatial light modulator and you basically make it go through what uh, this uh, random, uh, this diffusive medium that is uh, here in, in the black part here. And then when the light comes out of here, uh, of that uh, diffusive medium, it gets to be picked up by the camera and the camera essentially is this uh, Y vector. And so let me show you what happens when you're shining a laser through a diffusive medium. You get to see that light interfere with each other, uh, with, with itself uh, through the whole medium. And this is uh, one with, uh, a uh, few uh, elements. But what you get to see on the camera is the, the this whole interaction of all these uh, uh, interferences with each other. Interestingly speaking, what that means is we are capable of having about a vector of about a million size, uh, uh, a vector that is about a million size. And you get to have as an answer, a vector Y that is about the same size, about a million. And you have the matrix equivalent of about 10 to the power 12 uh, random coefficients. It's actually uh, two, two and 10 to the power 12 because those are complex from the random coefficients. So it's easily equi uh, equivalent to several terabytes of memory. We get to be doing this at several kilohertz. So we'll, it's not just a, a once in a while type thing. It's uh, mostly making sure that uh, uh, we get to be able to, to do these computations at a Peta ops type of uh, scale. And in order to do all this, we need to use about a few watts, a few tens of watt. Uh, let me recall to you what a GPU uh, currently uses. It's about 250 watts, and it cannot do several kilohertz of data uh, of the types that I'm mentioning here. So uh, given all this, um, uh, at Lighton, we've been essentially building these uh, OPUs that are doing random projections. And we've been using it to demonstrate it for uh, a diversity of uh, a set of use cases. You need to go to our blog to essentially see how it's being used. It's been used for um, uh, <coughs> uh, um, detections of uh, changes, a change detection type of uh, 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 data, as well as reinforcement learning, all the way to some more traditional supervised learning. And it's available on the cloud. Also, the fact is, uh, free space is bulky, is generally something that comes out of physicists when you're expecting them to do their experiments on the on the large table that doesn't move anything. We get to be able to do this in our next generation uh, at about the size that could fit onto a PCB uh, uh, board. Eventually, what I'm trying to tell you here is that we've been doing this, uh, we've been doing this random projection optically, and we've been able to show that it's actually uh, uh, doing well on uh, diversity of uh, model architectures and it scales past well large, the, some of the largest uh, uh, models uh, that uh, were computed in the past. We've been using it on uh, 
uh, NIST um, in the first place. That's one of the first uh, uh, data set that you want to see. But then eventually we looked at uh, uh, graph convolutional uh, type of uh, systems and then eventually a toy GPT model. But uh, I'll get to these uh, results a bit later uh, in the year. As you can see, uh, the what uh, when you get to be able to see what uh, the, the the DFA the optical DFA does compared to backpropagation done on silicon, uh, the the differentiation of features is is pretty similar to what you would be able to get in in both technologies. Um, one of the things that that happened to the, uh, yesterday is really that uh, you can get your own uh, uh, OPU in your own data center as of uh, yesterday. Up until now, we had a, a, a scheme where people could actually use our technology directly on Light on Cloud, where we have four or five now uh, OPUs. Uh, now you can get yours in your own data centers. And one more thing, um, we're not just looking at uh, training uh, optical networks. We're looking at uh, building optical transformers. And uh, eventually, in about a year from now, uh, we uh, ought to be uh, looking at uh, uh, proving there is an optical advantage in using OptiU Lighton's technology to build massive uh, models. All this uh, would, uh, wouldn't have been uh, uh, be able to, to be uh, uh, told without uh, the, the 19 people that are working at Lighton uh, so far. Um, as I said, we are mostly uh, a hardware company. Uh, with an AI company, uh, both uh, uh, talking to each other uh, every day. And uh, and we have had our technology running for about years now. And we're kind of uh, uh, looking for the next step in making sure that the next uh, generation of computing uh, gets to have uh, our technology. Uh, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you a lot, uh, Igor, for your presentation. So uh, we do have a, a couple of questions. Um, maybe there is a there is a, a question about uh, reproducibility. So I, I guess what I interpret the question as is uh, so in traditional uh, random number generators you can reproduce them using a seed, and here uh, is it possible using your technology? Is that a problem? Can you reproduce some results? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the the issue at hand here is making sure that the matrix gets to be uh, staying the same all, over time. And so uh, part of the engineering that goes into uh, uh, the OPU is making sure that the matrix stays the same. It's not a random matrix that changes over time. It comes from the same. Each co coefficients are essentially coming out of a, a specific distribution of a, a Gaussian uh, uh, Gaussian distribution, but the point of it is, as, as soon as they are there, they stay there. Um, it's not something that changes over time. So do I understand correctly that uh, each of your OP, OPUs basically basically contains uh, a fixed uh, random projection matrix? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, but a very, of course, huge size, but uh... it's it's actually very large. That's that's the yeah, main thing. Yeah. That is, if you were to be uh, using a von Neumann type of uh, um, uh, a silicone chip uh, that would be able to do these computations, you would see that you would be spending a lot of time doing the, the memory swap between the RAM and the, uh, the actual compute to essentially get these computations done. So what we're essentially providing here uh, as, a, as, a, as a fit thought experiment in a way is, is basically that in, in the future, we're kind of expecting that a lot of the computing is going to be uh, in, in two ways. There's going to be the, uh, uh, the the computing that we know already that can be done using the von Neumann architecture, where you essentially have to essentially permute uh, the the memory pretty often to get computations done. And there are a certain amount of memory where you don't really need to uh, to change the coefficients as much, where the fixed coefficients are good enough. And uh, this has been shown in compressive sensing to a very large extent. That is. Uh, you could see that uh, using just the same random projection was good enough to essentially get into uh, going beyond what you would be expecting from uh, Shannon's uh, theorem for uh, signal processing. So to a very large extent, the, 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 the fact is, if you get to be able to do these computations for free, like you can on the OPU, 
a lot of the algorithm that you can use are changing. And, and, and that's, that's liberating because uh, a lot of the paper we get to see when people are using random projection is trying to uh, remove the random part and try to change them with sparse approximation of them. It's fun and dandy, but the problem is that eventually you get to be spending the whole paper on how you replace the, the, the dense projection, uh, the, rent, uh, the dense random projection into a sparse random projection without going the next step as to why it is useful for other purposes than just approximating the dense random projection. So uh, it's, in French, I'm calling it very often la stratégie du contournement by most of the researchers, trying to essentially go around uh, things that are very difficult to compute and eventually trying to find a way. But at, at that point, they don't have that many people that follow them and they will not get that many citations. So uh, a little bit like what Sarah said in, uh, in her uh, hardware lottery uh, uh, essay, um, if you give people um, to a very large extent uh, a new type of hardware that does things that are very difficult to do on safe on chips and everything, um, you are essentially opening the door for much more creativity in a new algorithm. And one of the things I presented today uh, to you is, is really coming out of that. That is, the creativity of us looking at DFA has been mostly because we knew how to do random projections in the first place. And, and to a very large extent, you cannot investigate DFA um, if you do not have these very large size uh, matrices. If you see some of the papers talking about DFA in, uh, in Scholar, you get to be able to see people that are essentially saying that it doesn't work at, at too large a scale, mostly because they do not have the resources to actually uh, do this computation themselves. And so to, uh, what I'm really trying to say is that the, the tool itself changes the algorithm and the algorithm changes the tool. And so that's a bit what I was trying to, uh, to point out here today at, uh, and, and show you what we do at Lightroom. And so maybe to just to follow up to just to, yeah. to confirm because I got a lot of uh, some questions also on that topic. So so what what an OPU is it absolutely not something like a random number generator. It has a, it is a, it has this fixed okay. matrix and it is really a, something which is can, can considered a, a random projection but with the same matrix over and over again. So it is completely different from a. And, and you know if someone comes with a a huge case where those uh, calculations need to be moving. Uh, I'm sure half the company uh, here at Lighton will be uh, embracing that uh, uh, that new algorithm that essentially requires those matrices to change, and we'll make sure that those matrices are changing at a rate that cannot be sustained in uh, in uh, in silicon. Uh, someone was actually asking about other applications like two massive Monte Carlo methods. In that oh, direction. I, yeah, I, I, uh, well, I, I think one of the Monte Carlo way of looking at this has been uh, in machine learning has been uh, using uh, random features. Uh, when you take a look at this paper from uh, uh, Resh and Rahimi back in uh, um, uh, 2007, you get to see that they actually need those random projections to be uh, to be there. And and uh, uh, it really uh, seems to acknowledge that those methods are very useful. Uh, because they're essentially um, Monte Carlo approximation of kernels. Um, since it has received, uh, I think, the, the time, uh, the, the award of uh, the time, I, I can't remember, a test of time type of award uh, at New Apes uh, last year or the year before, uh, it, it's mostly because people realize that um, in order to uh, approximate some of these kernels and many other uh, potentially other uh, uh, functions, uh, you get to, the only way to access it is through a Monte Carlo type of techniques, like the ones they devised back in 2007. And maybe one one last question. So thank you for your answer. So uh, about, uh, yeah, so uh, how, um, how how useful are mathematicians to you? Are you uh, working half with mathematicians or rather other profiles? I mean, you yourself has a very, very broad profile. I mean, you uh, I, I understand that you are, uh, you, you are both a foot in mathematics and a foot in physics, or I don't know, but... Uh... I, I, I think uh, what we uh, generally require at, at Lighton is, well, first of all, as you probably have figured out, uh, when I got uh, together with two other co-founders, I, I tried to hire uh, 
I try to get people that were smarter than me. And so my my point of view is to always hire people that are uh, smarter than me in in some respect or another. And so uh, uh, getting a PhD in mathematics is definitely one way to go about this because I, I don't have one. Um, but, the, but the point of it is uh, that um, we are not looking specifically at, uh, at past work. We're looking at how curious people are. Uh, we currently have uh, uh, three uh, PhD, uh, 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 three students that are doing their PhD within, uh, uh, within Lycon. Part of this presentation is actually part of uh, uh, one of uh, these uh, students' uh, uh, PhD thesis right now, and that person is essentially taking on the, uh, the some of the work that goes into this extreme scale type of training that we are uh, pushing over at Lighton. So the, my my point being that um, uh, aside from a PhD per se, uh, I'm much more interested in people that are curious and potentially much more uh, smarter than me, but that's a different way of, of looking at it, but much more curious than uh, than other people. Uh, the main um, aspect of uh, our work absolutely requires people to uh, know what they don't know. Uh, we have to have a common language between people that are doing the hardware, uh, people, people that are doing optics, um, because they are different kinds than the, the mathematicians. Um, we have to have a different kind of people when we're talking to uh, uh, integrated circuits and eventually uh, some of the intran integration. All this requires uh, people that have seen very tough problems and try to essentially uh, swim along those things. And so I think one of the things that comes out of uh, doing a PhD in mathematics or uh, other f related fields is really that uh, we know that people have been left alone for about three years or even five years in some other countries. and and they've been able to actually push through and get out and, and essentially find out uh, their their voice to a certain extent. And so we're looking for this type of profiles because we know that they are the ones that are going to be bringing us the next use case or the next big thing that we want on which we're going to be striving over at uh, Lighton. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Igor. So I'm sorry I have to cut you because we are running a little bit late. So thank you a lot for our presentation and your uh, comprehensive uh, answers to the questions. So now we'll uh, leave the place to the next speaker. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me.